repentance. We are called to do it. And although in a different way, but analogous, God himself does it. What is it? The word itself in the Greek in which the New Testament was written literally means a change of mind. What I thought was good to do, and maybe what I justified doing, with all kinds of rationalizations and intellectualizations, we're really good at making up reasons and excuses for doing what we do and not doing what we don't do. But what I once justified, what I once thought was the right thing to do, maybe I was fooling myself and I knew it, or maybe I just really sincerely believed it was the right thing to do, I now have a metanoia, repentance, conversion, change of the mind. Because it begins in the mind, right? What I think leads to things I say, what I think leads to things I do, begins in the mind. A change. So that what we think in our minds is good, really is good. And then we foster a desire for it, and then we begin to integrate all our actions, our desires, our priorities, our decisions, our way of life. We begin to integrate that around. We make the center of gravity that which is good in the sight of God. Not simply in our own opinion, but in the sight of God. Now, the kingdom of God has come among us. That's the person of Jesus Christ. His teachings reflect perfectly the teachings of God the Father, because He and the Father are one. God becomes visible, comes into our history, into time, begins speaking and teaching and preaching and doing miracles and calling people, as we heard in the gospel, calling them to follow him, calling them to faith. And therefore we know what is right in the sight of God. We have to focus on him. Notice what he says here, repent and believe in the gospel, but something happens first. The repentance does not come first. What comes first is the kingdom of God inserting itself into our world and into our history and into our lives. Notice carefully what it says here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. In other words, therefore, as a result of this kingdom breaking into your life, as a result of this well, he says, time of fulfillment, because it was pointed to and foretold by the prophets, but as a result of the fact that now all that the prophets foretold has happened and God has broken into our world, has revealed himself clearly and taught us this new way of life. And it's not just that he teaches us this way of life. He gives us the spirit. He gives us rebirth from above. He transforms us so that we can live it. Therefore, repent. Change your mind about the, the ways that you thought were right. Change your mind. The beliefs that you thought were true but weren't. Bring it into line now with this kingdom that has come among you. This word that has been spoken to you. This gospel that has been preached to you. Believe it. Notice how repentance and faith go together. Repent and believe in the gospel. He transforms us. He gives us a new life. Repentance is not simply about following some rules or re and regulations or God taking away our freedom. You know, when John Paul II always said, be not afraid, he wasn't just talking in a natural level of, oh, don't worry so much, don't have so much anxiety. No, it was much deeper than that. It was open wide the doors to Christ. Don't be afraid that when you welcome Christ, when this kingdom of God comes among you, when you repent and believe in the gospel, don't be afraid that he's going to take away your freedom or your happiness, or it's going to be a burden too great to bear. This goes along with Jesus' other words that say, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because this gospel, this kingdom, is the one who made us. He made us to live his commandments. They're not external 
burdensome requirements on us that are going to crush our freedom or take away our joy. It's just the opposite. So repentance is our call. A call so powerful that it it creates an urgency. And you saw the urgency. These men were fishing and boom, in in one moment they're there, the next moment they're gone. You imagine how Zebedee and the hired men felt. You know, where, where did they just go? Where did they go? They started following Jesus. What a persuasive call that is. Oh, they're going to just drop their nets, leave their father there and go follow him. And this is the sense of urgency St. Paul brings us in the second reading today. He says, listen, everything's changing. Don't get too attached to it, is what he's saying. Everything's changing. The kingdom of God has broken into the world. God breaks into the world that he made and that he wants to save. Paul writes... In the second chapter of the first letter to Timothy, God wants all to be saved and to come to know the truth. Catholic, the word means universal. He's giving this call to everyone. And in his merciful love, you know, in his desire for us to repent, you know, it's because the sins we're committing are hurting us. You know, God is not selfish. When God wants us to change and says, stop offending me by sin and have a metanoia, have a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of will, a change of direction, a change in your center of gravity, a change in your priorities, follow me. He's saying that because that's the only good thing for us. Second Vatican Council in Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, lists a lot of the evils of our times, including abortion, And it has a fascinating line there. After going through a litany of terrible evils and sins in the world, you know what it says? It says, these things harm those who commit them even more than the victims. And of course, we know that in the work of mercy that we carry out in Rachel's Vineyard and Silent No More, both of which I serve as pastoral director worldwide. We bring the mercy of God to those who have aborted their children, we see close up the damage it does to them. Second Vatican Council says when you have all these sins against human dignity, they do more harm to the perpetrators than to the victims. That's a new way of thinking, isn't it? Well, therefore, you can see that it's because of his love for you that he calls you to repent. He's not interested in punishing you. He's interested in liberating you. From the power of sin, Jesus says those who sin are are slaves to sin. The devil doesn't mess around. He doesn't want to just take a little bit. He wants to take us all. And so there's no playing around with sin. The coward wins is a phrase that a lot of spiritual writers have used over the centuries. In other words, you run away from that which is drawing you into evil. You don't... don't, uh, Play with it. You don't dabble with it. You don't tease it. You run in the opposite direction. You run into the arms of the Lord, into the grace of the Spirit. So God says to Nineveh in this first reading, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. He sends the prophet Jonah. I'm going to destroy the city because of its sins. Again, these sins do more harm to the perpetrators than to the victims. It's going to destroy us if we continue in sin. So God sends Jonah. Now, Jonah didn't want to come. That's why he ended up in the belly of the whale. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to do this mission of proclaiming to Nineveh, 40 days more and you will be destroyed. Repent of your sins. You know why? Because he knew that God is a merciful God. And he had this attitude, you know, that The chosen people, you know, we're the ones God revealed his covenant to us through Moses. Now I'm going to these foreigners, these Ninevites. Oh, they should be. They should die for their sins. They're not part of us. They don't know the true God. But he didn't have the, 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 the vision that God has and revealed to us in Christ, as again Paul said to Timothy, God wants all to be saved. So this message, yes, it came first to the Jews, but it was for the whole world. Nineveh was part of that world. Jonah didn't quite understand that. And so God had to teach Jonah as much as he had to teach Nineveh about his ways. 
and say, look, I created these people. They're mine. I love them. They're not part of the original chosen people, but go to them because we have to have them turn away from their sins too that are destroying them. By the way, on that note of the sins destroying the perpetrator more than the victim, I, I always like to relate the story of one of the, one of the countless uh, pro-life talks that I've given across the country at different events. I was walking in one night to one of these pro-life banquets about to give a major talk, and there were pro-abortion demonstrators outside. And as uh, I was walking by them, they started yelling, Why do you hate us? When I got in, I started my talk and, and I referred to the protesters outside and I said, you know, these people were saying on the way in, why do you hate us? And I said, my response is, we do not hate you. Because if we hated you, we would leave you alone. Think about that. People think we're intruding. We're trying to tell people how to live when we tell them, here's the gospel of God. The kingdom of God is among you. Repent. And people say, mind your own business. If we hated you, if we wanted to see you destroyed by your own sins, if we wanted to see your erroneous and destructive way of life and way of thinking just eat you up, we would mind our own business. And we would let you be destroyed by your sins. If God hated Nineveh, if Jonah hated Nineveh, he'd just leave it alone. Let them destroy themselves. It's precisely because God doesn't want us to destroy ourselves that he threatens the punishment so that we can wake up and turn away from what leads to it. So that we can be saved, that we can be liberated. It's precisely because he loves us that he gives this warning of punishment. It's part of his merciful love to invite us to repent. God himself repents when he sees us turn away from our sins of the evil that he was going to carry out. Technically, the evil is built in to the sin already. I mean, that's just the way God made creation. But we see various instances of Scripture where God expresses it this way, that he himself will repent. He will relent of the evil he intended to carry out. Well, he only chastises us because he loves us. Again, to wake us up and make us turn away from that evil. But let's look at a couple of those passages. In Exodus 32, when Moses is on the mountain, he's getting the commandments. The people, meanwhile, create an idol to create a terrible sin. And the Lord says to Moses, Go down at once to your people. They have turned away from what I pointed out to them. Let me alone then, God is saying to Moses, that my wrath may blaze up against them and consume them. And then I will make of you a great nation. But then Moses intervenes and says to God, Why should your wrath blaze up against your own people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt? Relent. Let your blazing wrath die down. Relent in punishing your people. And God does it. Scripture says, The Lord relented in the punishment He threatened to inflict on His people. We see similarly in Jeremiah chapter 19, chapter 18 rather, Potter's Vessel, Jeremiah, at God's command, goes down and he sees this potter making the clay whichever way he wants to make it. And God says, you know, you're like that clay in my hands. And then he says in Jeremiah 18, 7, Sometimes I threaten to uproot and tear down and destroy a nation or a kingdom. But if that nation which I have threatened turns from its evil, I also repent of the evil which I threatened to do. Then he gives the other side of the coin. Sometimes, again, I promise to build up and plant a nation and a kingdom, but if that nation does what is evil in my eyes, refusing to obey my voice, I repent of the good which with, with which I promise to bless it. God takes a cue from us. It's amazing, right? He looks at us. And he says, look, your destiny is in your hands. 
Turn from your evil ways, and I will turn from the punishment I have pointed out will be yours if you continue in sin. So, brothers and sisters, our repentance, the gospel, and the other readings are telling us today, needs to be immediate. We need to take care of it today. Now is the day of salvation. And it also needs to be sincere, and it needs to be thorough. There are a lot of fake kinds of repentance. I just want to touch on a couple of things here. First of all, there's the superficial, or you might call it the superstitious repentance. This is when people are just going through the motions, but they're not really having that metanoia. They're not really having a change of mind. This is people who, they'll say, the, they'll even say prayers in the act of contrition, or they'll go to Mass. Oh, yes, Lord, have mercy. Or beat their breasts, you know, say the, the confidior at the beginning of Mass. But they're not really looking deep at, at, at what it is that they're doing wrong. They might not even understand what their sins are or why they're wrong. They're not really making an effort to abandon those sins. It's superficial repentance. It's not enough just to, you know, confess your sins or go, go to confession. Or If you're not really turning away, I don't want that sin anymore. Or if you keep pretending or defending that the, that, that the evil you're doing is really good. That's, that's not repentance. That, that's not, that's not going to bring salvation. And then you have what I would call politically correct repentance. You know, repentance needs to be, it needs to be thorough. It needs to cover all the, the, the wrong that we are doing. And it, and it needs to be based on God's word, not on what's politically correct. In the politically correct kind of repentance, people kind of jump on a bandwagon of whatever evils the politically correct crowd is denouncing. So today, what would it be? Well, racism. Now, of course, racism is wrong. But I mean, the extent to which people are bending over backwards to denounce racism today is, doesn't match the reality. You know, we had uh, Biden talk the other day in his inaugural about, oh, you know, we have to fight against white supremacy and systemic racism. Yeah, systemic racism, sitting there in the presence of the uh, former President uh, Obama, in the presence of uh, Kamala Harris just being sworn in as the first female African-American descent, Asian-American descent vice president, and uh, Justice Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. Sure, yeah, systemic racism is in evidence everywhere, isn't it? Enough already with jumping on the bandwagon and exaggerating a problem. The most racist people in our country, I tweeted out the other day, are the people who slap the word racism on everything they disagree with. So superficial, uh, 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 politically correct repentance is when you know, you're just jumping on a bandwagon to denounce certain evils. And again, that's not to say they aren't evils. But it's like you don't have the, the right proportionality. You, you, you're not responding to the real problems. There's bigger problems that are not being denounced. More frequent sins that are not being, uh, they're not part of the politically correct uh, uh, um, outrage. And so you're missing the mark. And the repentance is, 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 is not, it's not hitting the nail on the head. You know, oh, well, we have to repent of, you know, uh, making the earth uh, change its climate. You know, that's a boatload of garbage in this all this climate change stuff. Boatload of garbage. Make, making people feel guilty for, you know, I don't know, using cars. And, I mean, this is ridiculous. Don't fall into a politically correct repentance. Let it be what the actual, addressing the actual problem that it is. And then you have selective repentance. And this is closely connected with pharisaical scandal. Look it up. Pharisaical scandal is when we are disedified, we are scandalized, okay, by actions of others that are actually innocent or indifferent. They are good or indifferent actions. But because of our own extreme moral weakness or ignorance, we complain about the good actions of somebody else. It's like when Jesus, you know, the Pharisees, this Pharisaical scandal, because the Pharisees engaged in it all the time. Oh, well, Jesus is curing on the Sabbath. They weren't paying attention to the cure and to the fact that this was the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Messiah who would come and make the blind see and the lame dance for joy and would even raise the dead. No, 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 but if he did a curing on the Sabbath, these Pharisees, again, always focusing on the wrong thing, 
Or say, oh, but you did it on the Sabbath. Never mind that you did it. Oh, you did it on the Sabbath. This is all over the place. In politics, in the church, it's all over the place. It's pharisaical scandal. To those who engage in it, whether you are religious people or secular people, the words of Matthew 25, take them, read them, apply them to yourself. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier things of the law, judgment and mercy and fidelity. These you should have done without neglecting the others. Blind guides who strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you cleanse the outside of cup and dish, but inside they are full of plunder and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, cleanse first the inside of the cup, so that the outside may also be clean. We've got people all scandalized by other people getting angry at evils in the world, like abortion, or like the tearing up of our constitution, or the betrayal of our nation. They're getting more angry that we're angry than at the evil we're angry about. This is pharisaical scandal. And it's selective repentance. Just like Jesus is railing about in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and every kind of filth. On the outside you appear righteous, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and evil doing. It's the Democrat Party, by the way. They try to be all self-righteous. And they're straining the net and swallowing the camel every single day. Hypocrites that they are. And so, brothers and sisters, let us take hold of repentance in all its fullness, with all sincerity, in all its depth, with its call of immediacy. The kingdom of God is among us. God wants all to be saved. He threatens punishment only to awaken our conscience that He may give us life as we turn away from our sins. Let us rejoice because the kingdom of God is among us. Let us feast as Paul says, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's metanoia, there's repentance. It's, it's immersed in sin, with sincerity and truth. That brings us joy. That brings us strength in following God's gospel. That brings us salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The kingdom of God is among us. We do repent and we do believe. Amen.